The First Crusade, A Clash of Faiths and Empires In the year of our Lord 1096, a momentous event shook the foundations of the world. From the heart of Christendom, a mighty host of knights and foot soldiers set forth on a journey of faith and conquest. Their destination, the Holy Land, then under the control of the infidel Muslims. This was the First Crusade, the most momentous and consequential of all the Crusades. It was a time of great upheaval and change, a time when the fate of empires hung in the balance. The Crusaders came from all walks of life, united by a common purpose, to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim rule. Some were driven by religious zeal, others by a thirst for adventure or glory. But whatever their motivations, they were all part of a grand historical drama that would forever alter the course of history. The Crusaders' journey was long and arduous. They marched across Europe, facing countless dangers along the way. They battled disease, hunger, and the elements. They fought their way through hostile lands, overcoming fierce resistance from Muslim forces. After a year of hardship and sacrifice, the Crusaders finally reached their destination. In 1099, they laid siege to the holy city of Jerusalem. The battle raged for weeks, with neither side giving an inch. Finally, on July 15, the Crusaders breached the city walls and poured in, victorious. What followed was a scene of carnage and bloodshed. The Crusaders slaughtered the Muslim defenders, sparing neither men, women, nor children. It was a brutal and merciless victory, a dark stain on the history of the Crusades. The capture of Jerusalem was a turning point in the First Crusade. It marked the beginning of a new era in Christian-Muslim relations, an era of conflict and mistrust that would last for centuries. The First Crusade was a complex and multifaceted event. It was a religious war, a political struggle, and a social movement all rolled into one. It had a profound impact on the course of history, shaping the world we live in today. Note. This is just a brief overview of the First Crusade. There are many other aspects of this event that could be discussed in more detail. In the late 11th century, a wave of religious fervor swept through Europe. While the three great faiths coexisted peacefully in Palestine, Christians in Europe were stirred by the call for a crusade to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim rule. On November 25, 1095, Pope Urban II addressed the Council of Clermont, issuing a rallying cry to rescue the Holy Sepulchre from the hands of the unclean. Though strategic and geopolitical factors undoubtedly played a role in the First Crusade's inception, the primary catalyst was a plea for help from Byzantine Emperor Alexios I alarmed by the Seljuk Turks' westward expansion and the threat they posed to Constantinople. Alexios dispatched envoys to the Council of Piacenza in March 1095, seeking military assistance from Pope Urban II. Urbanus saw this as an opportunity to reunite the Christian world, which had split into the Orthodox and Catholic churches four decades earlier. By extending aid to the Orthodox Church in the East, Urbanus hoped to assert papal primacy and restore Christian unity. In July 1095, Urbanus returned to his native France to rally support for a military expedition. In Clermont, he delivered a stirring sermon to a crowd of nobles and clergy, vividly depicting the atrocities supposedly inflicted on Eastern Christians and pilgrims to the Holy Land. While multiple versions of this sermon exist, none can be definitively attributed to Urbanus himself. They were all recorded after the First Crusade, following the capture of Jerusalem by the Crusaders, making it impossible to discern the true content of his speech. Despite variations in detail, the general message of Urbanus's sermon was clear. European society was plagued by violence, and the peace of God must be upheld. Aid must be sent to the beleaguered Byzantines in the East. Crimes against Christians had been committed, 
and a new kind of warfare was needed, an armed pilgrimage. Those who died on this crusade would be absolved of their sins and granted a place in paradise, while those who returned would be rewarded with earthly riches. Though none of the versions explicitly state that the ultimate goal was to reach Jerusalem, Urbanus's subsequent sermons made it clear that this was indeed the target of the military expedition. Thus, the First Crusade was launched, setting in motion a series of events that would forever alter the course of history. The Call to Crusade, a Gathering of Warriors Urbanus's carefully crafted sermon ignited a spark of religious fervor across Europe. He had shrewdly enlisted the support of two key southern French leaders, Count Raymond de Saint Giles of Toulouse and Adhemar, Bishop of Puy, before launching the concept of the Crusade. Adhemar himself had been present at the Council of Clermont and was the first to take the cross, pledging to join the expedition. Throughout 1095 and into 1096, Urbanus tirelessly spread his message, traveling across France and sending his legates to regions he could not reach personally. The idea resonated far beyond the Pope's expectations, even eclipsing the enthusiasm of Emperor Alexios himself. While Urbanus initially sought to restrict the crusade to trained soldiers, excluding women, monks, and the infirm, popular sentiment quickly overwhelmed these restrictions. It was not the high-ranking knights, skilled in warfare, who flocked to join the cause, but rather the common folk, peasants with little or no wealth and no combat experience. A new wave of Christian fervor, unbridled by church or state, swept across Europe. A typical ceremony would begin with Urbanus expounding on his vision, followed by a pledge of allegiance from the Crusaders, who would then receive a red cloth cross to sew onto their garments, symbolizing their commitment to the holy pilgrimage. Explaining the reasons behind this outpouring of religious zeal and the unexpectedly large number of volunteers is a complex task. Historian Thomas Asbridge acknowledges the difficulty of determining the exact number of participants and their motivations, given the limited sources and evidence available. Nevertheless, some hypotheses have been proposed. Deep personal faith. In an era where religion permeated every aspect of life, it is reasonable to assume that many participants were driven by a sincere desire to contribute to the cause. However, the lack of first-hand accounts from the peasant majority leaves this hypothesis difficult to verify. Escape from hardship. Some scholars argue that the widespread rural hunger and constant warfare in France may have motivated peasants to seek a better life in the unknown lands of the East. However, concrete evidence to support this claim is scarce. Greed and ambition. The upper class, on the other hand, may have been motivated by the prospect of material gain and political power. The story of Bohemian, Count of Norman Otranto, serves as an example. According to 20th century British historian Stephen Runciman, many of the nobles and knights who joined the First Crusade were younger sons with little inheritance to expect. They may have seen the East as an opportunity to make their fortune. However, the fact that most of these nobles returned home after the Crusade weakens this hypothesis. Additionally, it is known that participating in the Crusade was a costly endeavor for noble families, and the spoils of war often failed to cover the expenses. For example, Duke Robert Curtoz sold his Duchy of Normandy to finance his participation, while Godfrey de Bouillon mortgaged his family's lands to the church. The Journey of the Crusaders Once the Crusaders had assembled, they faced the daunting task of crossing vast distances and hostile territories to reach their destination. The Crusaders' passage through Christian lands. The aid that the Byzantines sought from the Christians did not come in the form of orderly troops. Instead, it arrived as vast hordes of people, far beyond what Emperor Alexios I had anticipated or desired. This unexpected influx of Crusaders alarmed Alexios, 
who feared that their food and shelter needs would overwhelm Byzantine lands and cities, causing immense harm to both rural and urban populations. Moreover, it was clear that many of the Crusades' leaders were not motivated by religious duty, but rather by the ambition to conquer and establish their own autonomous states. To address these dangers, Alexios devised a clever plan. Byzantine troops would accompany the Crusader armies as they entered Byzantine territory in the Balkans, guiding them and ensuring they remained on designated routes and encampments. These Byzantine escorts would also oversee the Crusaders foraging for food and supplies. At designated camps, markets would be established where the Crusaders could purchase their provisions with their own money. However, some Byzantine cities, such as Nis, opposed the establishment of these markets, fearing that they would strain local resources. The Crusaders, on the other hand, complained that the prices in these markets were exorbitantly high and that they were constantly being cheated by merchants and locals. This created a constant potential for conflict between the Crusaders and the Balkan locals. To ensure the smooth passage of the Crusaders, Alexios hired a large number of Pechenig mercenaries, who spoke Turkic, and encouraged the presence of food merchants at the designated camp encampments. As a result, the Crusader commanders brought with them large amounts of gold and silver coins to finance their journey. However, exchanging these European coins for Byzantine currency proved to be a problem. Some Crusader commanders, particularly the quick-tempered Tancred, objected to having to purchase their own provisions. To appease these complaints, the Byzantine emperor distributed gifts of gold and silver coins to certain Crusader leaders. When a Crusader contingent arrived in Constantinople, they were required to camp outside the city in a designated area guarded by the Byzantine army. The Crusaders were forbidden from foraging for water, food, or fodder near the camp. Under the guidance of Byzantine guides, small groups of Crusaders could visit the churches, streets, squares, monuments, and palaces of this great and opulent city. Each Crusader commander was required to present himself before the Byzantine Emperor, kiss his hand and feet, swear allegiance, and agree to surrender any former Byzantine territory he might conquer. After these formalities, the Crusader armies would cross the Bosporus on Byzantine ships and enter Anatolia, which was under the control of the Seljuk Turks. From there, it was up to them to continue their journey and secure their own food, water, and forage. However, the Byzantines would continue to provide guides and offer military assistance and support. Throughout their journey through Anatolia, Syria, and Palestine, the Crusaders often resorted to plundering for supplies. However, in order to avoid antagonizing the friendly populations along their route, they also continued to purchase provisions whenever possible. Note, this is an ongoing translation. I will continue to translate the text in the same epic and dramatic style, maintaining its historical accuracy and objectivity. The People's Crusade The First Crusade officially commenced in 1096, with the participating Crusader armies arriving in waves. The initial wave, numbering around 40,000 people, was led by a monk named Pierre from Amiens, under the command of a monk. This group consisted mainly of northern French, German, and a smaller number of northern Italian peasants and their families, earning it the name, People's Crusade, due to the scarcity of nobles. Before entering Byzantine territory in Belgrade, this wave caused chaos in Zemin, which belonged to Hungary across the Sava River, due to a dispute over a shoe, attacking the inner castle and killing 4,000 Hungarians. They then plundered and burned Belgrade. As the group proceeded, they faced various complaints from the Byzantine people. Upon reaching Nis, they incited another rebellion, but this time, the Byzantine Emperor Alexios I sent a cavalry force to suppress the Crusader uprising. 
By the time this group reached Constantinople on August 1, 1096, it had lost a quarter of its strength. Emperor Alexios forgave the disruptions caused by this group in the Balkans but ordered them to move quickly to Asia, staying outside Constantinople. Despite being allowed to explore the city in controlled small groups, complaints arose about thefts committed by the Crusaders, including looting nearby villas and even stealing lead from a nearby church roof. Under Emperor Alexios's command, this group was transported to Anatolia under protection on August 6, accompanied by Byzantine guides, directed towards Nicomedia. Nicomedia had been ravaged by the Seljuk army 15 years prior and was in ruins. The Crusaders captured the city and, within their ranks, disputes arose between the French Crusaders and the German-Italian contingent led by Reynal, rejecting the command of Pierre Lermite. The Franks under Geoffrey Burrell and the German-Italians under Reynald separated. Dividing into two groups, the Crusaders circumvented the Gulf of Izmit, settling near Yalova in separate locations called Chibotos, next to an old abandoned castle used as a base by the Anglo-Saxon mercenary guards under the command of the Byzantine Emperor Alexios. In a conversation with Pierre Lermit, Emperor Alexios advised the Crusader army to rest there, await the arrival of the barons' crusade armies coming from the Balkans, and follow them. However, the Frank Crusaders did not comply. Instead, they pillaged the surroundings. In these raids, they disregarded whether the local population was Orthodox Christian. In mid-September, a group of Frank Crusaders, led by Reynald, conducted a raid near Iznik, causing significant harm to the Greek-speaking population by torturing men, women, and children and seizing valuables, foodstocks, and livestock. This attracted the envy of the 6,000-strong German-Italian crusader unit under Reynolds' command, which, in late September, departed from the camp at Yalova. They marched towards Iznik, collecting spoils from the surroundings. Unlike their counterparts, they did not attack the Greek-speaking inhabitants. They captured a fortress named Caseragordos, using it as a base due to its abundant supplies. However, the fortress had a disadvantage. It was situated on a hill, and its water source came from a spring and a well located below the castle. The Seljuk ruler, Sultan Kilij Arslan I, sent a significant Seljuk army unit under a high-ranking commander to besiege the castle. On September 29, the Seljuk forces began the siege and repelled a sally made by Reynal. Subsequently, they captured the only water sources outside the castle, cutting off the water supply. The crusaders inside the castle resisted the siege for eight days, ultimately surrendering. During negotiations, it was announced that if Reynald converted to Islam, his life would be spared, and the other crusaders would also be forgiven if they embraced Islam. Those who refused to convert were immediately killed after the castle surrender. The ones who accepted Islam were exiled to Anatolia, Antioch, and Aleppo. News about the German-Italian unit under Reynolds' command reached the Crusaders in the camp at Yalava quite late. The information about the fall of the Caseragordos castle and the fate of the Crusaders there only arrived at the end of October. Various rumors circulated in the camp afterward, primarily spread by two Turkish spies, suggesting that the unit had captured Iznik, hoarded a significant booty, and refrained from sending news to avoid sharing the spoils. Hearing this, panic spread among the leading crusaders in the camp who, in the absence of Pierre Lermite, convened a war council. While some leaders hesitated to leave the camp, a Frank leader named Geoffrey Burrell proposed marching towards Izmet with all the warriors in the camp. The proposal was accepted as the warrior crusaders supported it. On October 21, a crusader force of over 20,000 warriors, including both Frank and German-Italian units, left the camp with the goal of advancing towards Izmet. 
Only the sick, women, and children remained in the camp. The army advanced on a road leading to Iznik, passing through a wooded valley about five kilometers from the camp. At the Kirkjesset location in this valley, a large Seljuk force had set up an ambush. The Battle of Kirkjesset began with a widespread volley of arrows from Seljuk light cavalry against the unsuspecting Crusader heavy cavalry. The vanguard Crusaders, taken by surprise, panicked, and the rear Crusader infantry quickly began to retreat. Consequently, the entire Crusader army succumbed to panic and fled back to Chibotos. Pursuing Seljuk light -like cavalry closely followed them, infiltrating the Crusader camp. The camp was unprepared for defense and could not resist. About 3,000 Crusaders managed to escape to a ruined castle on the coast, where they defended themselves until the Byzantine warships arrived the next day. After being disarmed, those who managed to escape were placed in the city for repatriation. With the Battle of Kirkjesset, the Seljuks eliminated almost all the fighters of the Crusader army, concluding the People's Crusade. Pierre Lermite, the leader of the People's Crusade, survived because he was in Constantinople during the Seljuk attack. The Participating Barons in response to Pope Urban II's call for the Crusade, none of the rulers in Europe answered, and not a single ruler joined the First Crusade. However, several significant feudal barons participated in the First Crusade. These notable figures included, 1. Count Raymond IV of Toulouse or Raymond de St. Giles. 2. William the Good and his son Raymond the Good. 3. Count Bohemond of Taranto and his nephew Tancred, from the Norman ruler's family in southern Italy. 4. Hugh of Vermandois, the brother of French King Philip I. 5. Robert Cortehues, Duke of Normandy and brother of William the Conqueror, and his standard bearer knight, Lance. 6. Count Robert II of Flanders. 7. Godfrey de Bouillon, Duke of Lower Lorraine, his brother Bedouin of Boulogne, and his cousins Bedouin of Burgundy. 8. Count Stephen of Blois. 9. Count Ingerand I of Amiens and his son Thomas of Marl. 10. Count Hugh II of St. Paul and his son Ingerand. The Crusader army was divided into four main groups, each corresponding to their respective regions of origin. These groups were planned to travel through various routes and times to reach the Balkans and Constantinople. They included, 1. The army originating from Lorraine, led by Godfrey de Bouillon and Bedouin of Boulogne. This army would pass through Germany, entering the Balkans from the north. 2. The Norman army from Italy, led by Count Bohemond and his nephew Tancred de Hauteville. This force would land in Epirus in the Balkans and proceed eastward. 3. The army from southern France, led by Count Raymond de St. Giles. This group would enter the Balkans from northern Italy and move through Serbia and Macedonia. 4. The army of French Franks, led by Hugh Le Grand, Robert Cortehues, and Robert of Flanders. This force would follow the army from Lorraine with some delay. Arrival in Constantinople In August 1096, the four main crusader armies, totaling an estimated 30,000 to 35,000 soldiers, with 1,200 cavalry, set out from Europe. They traversed different paths through Europe and the Balkans, reaching the walls of Constantinople between November 1096 and April 1097. The first arriving contingent was commanded by Hugh Vermandois, followed by armies under the leadership of Godfrey de Bouillon, Raymond St. Giles, and Beaumondo. In contrast to the People's Crusade, known for its disastrous relations and grim outcomes, this was the Crusade of the Barons, better prepared by the Byzantines and Emperor Alexios. The Crusader armies were more disciplined, resulting in fewer incidents along their routes. 
Estimating the exact size of this crusader army is challenging, with modern historians reaching varying numbers using different sources and methods. According to a military historian, the total crusader force consisted of 30,000 to 35,000 soldiers, including 1,200 cavalry. The largest crusader army group, commanded by Count Raymond de Saint Giles, comprised 8,500 infantry and 1,200 cavalry. These princes and crusader armies arrived in Constantinople without sufficient supplies, expecting Emperor Alexios to provide food and fodder. Alexios was highly skeptical of this crusader army. The uneasy relationship and tragic outcome with the People's Crusade had fueled his suspicion. Emperor Alexios and the commanders of the Crusader armies, particularly Godfrey de Bouillon, had conflicting goals. The Emperor aimed to use this Crusader army to eliminate Turkmen migrants in Anatolia through Central Asia and Iran and eradicate the Anatolian Seljuk Sultanate. On the other hand, Godfrey de Bouillon and other Crusader commanders were focused solely on crossing Anatolia quickly, reaching Palestine, and capturing Jerusalem. The Emperor requested the commanders of the incoming Crusader army to swear an oath of allegiance, vowing to be vassals and return the former Byzantine lands they would conquer to imperial rule. The presence of Norman knights from southern Italy and Duke Bohemond raised significant concerns for Alexios. In the early years of his rule as Emperor, Alexios had to contend with Norman invasions led by Robert Giscard and his son Bohemond. The Normans had landed in the Balkans, occupied the port and region of Dyrrhachium, seized the island of Corfu, defeated the Byzantine army under Alexios's command in the Battle of Dyrrhachium, and advanced through Greece, besieging the Larissa fortress in Thessaly. They were eventually expelled from the Balkans by Alexios through a strenuous campaign. Hence, Alexios feared that Bohemond, using the armies outside the city, might conspire to seize Constantinople. The Crusaders, however, wanted Emperor Alexios to join the expedition. Still, the Emperor showed no inclination to command this peculiarly undisciplined army. Instead, he focused on ensuring their swift departure from his lands. Before providing provisions to the army, he insisted that the commanders appear before him, swear allegiance, and promise to return the conquered lands in Asia to the Byzantine Empire. Godfrey de Bouillon was the first to make this oath, and the others reluctantly followed suit. However, Raymond de Saint Giles hesitated, as he had already sworn an oath on the cross, but Byzantine diplomacy found a suitable formula, and he pledged only not to loot for supplies. Before allowing these armies to cross the strait, Alexios met with them, providing insights on tactics and strategies against the Seljuk forces. The Siege of Nicaea In 1097, the Crusader army of the barons crossed into Anatolia and joined forces with the remnants of Peter the Hermit's People's Crusade. Two Byzantine generals, Manuel Vudimidas and Tatikios, led a Byzantine army to provide guidance and support to the Crusaders. The initial target of this Crusader army was the ancient and renowned Byzantine city, which had become the Seljuk capital under Sultan Kilij Arslan. The success against Peter the Hermit's army led Sultan Kilij Arslan to underestimate the Crusader threat. Believing that the Crusaders couldn't advance to the city of Iznik, his capital, and considering it not a threat to his realm, he initially marched towards Malatya, held by Gabriel, the former Byzantine governor turned vassal under the Seljuks. However, the siege of Malatya failed due to its formidable city walls, forcing Kilij Arslan to return hastily, launching an attack on the besieging Crusader army on May 16. However, the assault failed, and both sides suffered significant casualties, leading to a withdrawal. Subsequently, the Crusader army surrounded Nicaea, but the city could be supplied with food brought by boat across Lake Iznik. 
Despite a quick return by Kilish Arslan, who attacked the besieging army on June 18, he couldn't break the siege. Facing substantial losses on both sides, a retreat became inevitable. Eventually, the Crusaders, with the aid of boats provided by the Byzantine Emperor, blocked the city's supply routes with felled trees, preventing food delivery by boat. In response, the Seljuk commander of the castle surrendered the city to the Byzantine forces on June 18. According to the rules of war at the time, the Crusader armies refrained from plundering the city since it was acquired by the Byzantines. This, however, caused significant dissatisfaction among the Crusader ranks, especially as they had expected to loot the city. Nevertheless, Emperor Alexios tried to appease them by offering substantial gifts. Thus, Nicaea returned to Byzantine control. The First Battle of Dorylium By the end of June, the Crusader army set out to march through Anatolia towards Jerusalem. One of the Frankish nobles, Count Stephen of Blois, wrote a rare letter to his wife, predicting that the journey would take five weeks. In reality, this passage took two years. To guide and support the Crusader army, a Byzantine detachment under Tatikios was attached. The Crusader army, for the sake of easier command and logistics, divided into two groups. One led by Bohemond consisting of Normans and the other by Godfrey de Bouillon and the papal representative Adamar, leading the Franks. Both groups were determined to unite in the Doralium plain near Eskashahir. On July 1, the leading group of Normans encountered Sultan Kilij Arslan's Seljuk army. Kilij Arslan had reinforced his army after the fall of Nicaea. The nimble archer cavalry of the Seljuks surrounded the Norman vanguard. The Normans quickly tightened their ranks, closing in on each other with non-combatants and supplies gathering around them for protection. Upon hearing of the Seljuk attack, a messenger was sent to the second group of Franks, led by Godfrey de Bouillon, informing them of the situation. Godfrey, along with armored Frankish heavy cavalry leading the second group, launched a counterattack against the encircling Seljuk forces. The Crusader charge, difficult for Seljuk arrows to penetrate due to heavy armor, successfully broke Kilij Arslan's encirclement, and the two Crusader groups merged. Adamar, leading a separate unit from the second group, passed through the edges of the battlefield and struck the Seljuks from behind. Realizing that the combined Crusader army could not be easily defeated in battle, Sultan Kilij Arslan, suffering considerable losses, had to withdraw. Crossing Anatolia Following the Battle of Doralium, there was no direct confrontation between the Seljuk and Crusader armies during the Crusader army's passage through Anatolia. After Doralium, Kilij Arslan adopted a strategy of observing the Crusader army from a distance, allowing them to pass through Anatolia quickly, and avoiding direct conflict. Following I. Alexios's advice and guided by Byzantine general Tatikios, the Crusader army, rather than following the traditional route of Christian pilgrims through Ankara, chose a safer southern route closer to Byzantine settlements. According to a credible modern source, the route through Anatolia taken by the Crusader army was as follows. Uluborlu, Yalvak, Akshahir, Ladik, Konya, Aragli, Kemerhizar, Nigda. Here, the Crusader army split into two. A portion, consisting mainly of Normans settled in southern Italy, led by Bomundo and Tancred, headed towards the Cilicia region, entering Cappadocia and Tarsus. The larger portion of the Crusader army, via Caesari and Karamanmaras, descended into Cilicia. Marching through Anatolia, the Crusader army faced challenges of hunger and thirst under the scorching Anatolian sun. Many soldiers and civilian members of the Crusader army, along with their animals, perished on this journey. They had to loot distant areas for water, supplies, and animal feed. 
While Christians in Anatolia did provide some assistance in terms of food and money, they did not significantly contribute to the disaster of the Crusader army. Additionally, Catholic Frankish Crusaders constantly looked down upon Orthodox Anatolian Christians, continuing their pillaging regardless of religious affiliation. During the Anatolian Passage, leaders of the Crusader army continuously struggled for supremacy. Although Adamar, the papal representative, was recognized as the spiritual leader, no prince or commander managed to secure the role of overall commander. Separately, a smaller portion of the Crusader army left the main force before reaching Antioch. Bedouin of Boulogne marched towards the Edessa territories near the Euphrates River. Expecting an inheritance of lands and wealth in Europe due to his wife's family, Bedouin, accompanied by his wife, initially sought assistance from Armenian Gabriel, a Byzantine mercenary commander who had seized control of Edessa in a coup after the death of its previous ruler. However, when Bedouin's wife died in Anatolia, he realized he couldn't secure the inheritance and became eager to find a kingdom he could rule alone in Anatolia. In early 1098, Edessa, then under the control of the Armenian commander Thoros, who proclaimed himself king under Byzantine suzerainty, had been taken by force. Not liked by the predominantly Greek Orthodox Christian population of Edessa, King Thoros sought Bedouin's help to consolidate his power. Upon reaching Urfa with his contingent of knights, Bedouin was adopted by Thoros in a special ceremony, making him the heir. Within a few weeks, Thoros was assassinated, and Bedouin took control, declaring himself Count of Edessa and establishing the first crusader state, the County of Edessa. In October 1097, the weary crusader armies arrived at the gates of Antioch. At that time, the commander of the fortress was Amir Yagi Sayan, a Turkish origin warrior who had served as a Ghulam under Sultan Meliksa of the Great Seljuk Empire, who had conquered Antioch in 1085. Appointed as the Emir of Antioch around 1090 by Meliksa, Emir Yagi Sayan was of Turkish origin. Antioch was a formidable fortress with walls made of stone and brick, approximately 12,000 meters in length, featuring 360 towers arranged in three tiers. It had a well-fortified structure, including an inner citadel on the habib i Necker mountain, to the east. The city had ample food storage within its walls, and gardens, orchards, and even fields were present inside the city walls. On the other hand, the Crusader army, numbering around 30,000, faced difficulties in finding sustenance for both humans and animals, as their foraging units had spread over extensive areas, even reaching the outskirts of Aleppo. Antioch was strategically located in a region where the weather was consistently rainy during that late season. The surroundings turned into a mud swamp, exacerbated by the rising waters of the Orontes River, making the Crusaders' situation more challenging. Unfamiliar with such conditions, they also faced an unexpected and terrifying natural occurrence, a series of occasional earthquakes, as Antioch was situated along a seismic fault line. Before the arrival of the Crusaders, Amir Yagi Sayan, anticipating the possible aid to the Christian inhabitants of the city by the Crusader armies, expelled all Christian men outside the fortress, fearing that they might assist their co-religionists. Amir Yagi Sayan commanded around 6,000 to 7,000 soldiers within the fortress. However, despite the numerical superiority of the Crusader army, Antioch's formidable defenses and the favorable geographical features posed significant challenges to the besiegers. Moreover, the Crusaders soon depleted the surrounding rural areas of their resources, facing increasing difficulty in gathering food and supplies. In December 1097, the Crusaders were informed that a sizable Muslim reinforcement, led by Sam Maliki Dukak, was approaching. Responding to this threat, 
Amir Yagi Sayan conducted a surprise night attack on the Crusader camp. The attack caused considerable losses among the Crusaders, including the papal representative's standard bearer. Toulouse Count Raymond de St. Giles hastily gathered a group of knights to counter the surprise assault, launching a heavy cavalry attack. The Crusader knights successfully repelled the attack, forcing the Muslim infantry to withdraw systematically. Around mid-December, the Crusaders faced a severe shortage of food and supplies. The main Crusader army had exhausted its stocks, and a special foraging force was sent towards the Hama direction, crossing the Orontes River via makeshift bridges. This detachment departed on December 29, tasked with collecting essential provisions. Upon learning of the departure of a significant portion of the Crusader army, Amir Yagi Sayan orchestrated a night assault on the northern side of the Orontes River, where the main Crusader camp was situated. The surprise attack caused substantial casualties among the Crusaders, leading to a retreat of their infantry. However, this attack did not account for the arrival of a Norman Crusader force under Bomundo, which further complicated the situation for the Muslims. Bomundo's delayed arrival allowed the Crusader knights to launch another cavalry attack, rescuing the besieged Flanderali Robert's army. In early January 1098, realizing that he needed additional support, Amir Yagi Sayan sought assistance from Sam Maliki Dukak, who had previously promised aid. Dukak assured him of support, and along with his Atabeg Tugtekin and Hums Amir Kana Ad Devla, they declared their intention to assist Antioch. On the other hand, Bidwan of Boulogne, a crusader leader, had marched towards the Edessa territories in Anatolia, establishing the county of Edessa after the death of Thoros, the Armenian ruler. In February 1098, Sam Maliki Dukat, along with Tugtekin and Amir Yagasayan's son Sems al Devla, marched towards Antioch with a supporting force. As they reached near Shazar, they received news of the presence of Crusader forces. Despite the lack of accurate intelligence, they advanced rapidly. The Crusaders, aware of the approaching Muslim forces, devised a plan to conduct a night attack. On the evening of February 8, Crusader knights, crossing the Orontes River via a pontoon bridge, carried out a swift cavalry night raid on a Muslim force tasked with collecting provisions in a village named Albara. The attack disrupted the Muslim archers and provided a distraction that allowed the main crusader force to engage the disorganized Halep army. The ensuing counterattack by the crusaders not only rescued Flanderali Robert's army but also inflicted significant casualties on the Muslim forces, forcing them to withdraw in disarray towards Hama. In the following days, Sam Maliki Dukak decided to abandon his military support for Antioch. This decision was influenced by the successful tactics of the Crusader Knights and the news of the defeat of Halep's supporting army. Amir Yagi Sayan, facing the dire situation, sought help from Ridvan, the Seljuk ruler of Aleppo. Ridvan, with the support of his cousin Artuklu Sokman Bey and Hama Amir, assembled a large army of a few thousand cavalry and set out in February. The Muslim army advanced near Antioch, preparing for an assault on the Crusader military camp. On the evening of June 2, Firuz, an Armenian-turned-Muslim armor smith, seeking revenge for Amir Yagi Sayan's punishment due to black market activities and enticed by the promised gold and land donations from the Crusaders, facilitated the entry of the Crusaders into the city through a window in the Two Sisters Tower. Realizing that the city had fallen into the hands of the Crusaders, Amir Yagasayan left his family behind and managed to escape the city with a guard unit of about 30 men. However, during their hasty escape, his horse stumbled, and both he and his horse were fatally wounded. Recognizing that he would receive no medical assistance, his guards abandoned him, leaving him severely injured. 
The next day, he was discovered in a dying state by a Christian Armenian peasant. The Armenian beheaded Yagi Sayan and, aiming to gain a reward, presented his head to the crusader commander who had captured Antioch. With the fall of Antioch on June 3, the crusader army unleashed a massacre and looting spree throughout the city, killing all Muslim inhabitants, including men, women, and children. They razed Muslim structures and, notably, destroyed mosques. The city witnessed widespread devastation at the hands of the victorious crusaders, who showed no mercy to the defeated Muslim population. The Fall of Antioch The inner citadel remained in the hands of Sems al devla The crusader armies launched assaults to capture this citadel, but its formidable defenses thwarted their efforts. During one of these attacks, Beaumondo, one of the crusader commanders, was wounded. Despite tempting offers of ransom, Sems al devla refused to abandon the inner citadel. The crusader army established a cordon with security outposts around the citadel and settled within the city. At this critical moment, just three days after the fall of Antioch, the reinforced army of Mosul Adabeg Kerboga appeared before Antioch. This army besieged the crusader forces within the citadel. Upon capturing the city, the crusaders discovered that the provisions of Yagi Sayan were at critically low levels. Although the crusaders had experienced famine before, they could send foraging units to distant areas for supplies. However, being trapped inside Antioch due to Kerboga's siege, this option was no longer available. According to the Arab historian Ali ibn el Esser, after capturing Antioch, the Franks endured 12 days without food inside the besieged citadel. Noble knights resorted to slaughtering their own horses for sustenance, while those less fortunate consumed dead animals, tree bark, and grass. Some sources even mention the emergence of cannibalism among the Crusaders. Meanwhile, discontent spread among Kerboga's troops at their camp. Many soldiers, officers, and commanders grew uneasy about Kerboga's reluctance to launch an immediate attack. They feared that if Kerboga won the battle, he might declare himself a great ruler and subjugate other emirs. Among those concerned, Dukak, the emir of Damascus, played a prominent role. Sensing the discontent among his soldiers, Kerboga went as far as seeking negotiations for a ceasefire. Viewing this as a sign of Kerboga's cowardice and incompetence, several emirs, led by Dukak, began preparing to abandon the army. Simultaneously, an unexpected miracle occurred within the inner citadel of Antioch. A monk named Pierre Barthélemy from Marseille among the Crusaders started having a series of religious visions. Saint Andrew revealed to him that the Holy Lance, used to kill Jesus after his crucifixion, was buried beneath the Cathedral of Antioch, and by using this lance, they would triumph over the Muslims. The designated location in the cathedral was excavated, and a lance was indeed found. While many doubted its miraculous nature, the morale of the Crusader army surged. Ali ibn el Esser, the Arab historian, asserts that Le Puy Archbishop Adamar, the papal representative among the Crusaders, hit a lance in Quisair and later discovered it. However, other sources state that Adamar from Le Puy was among those who doubted the miracle. With the newfound high morale, the Crusader army, led by Archbishop Adamar with the Holy Lance, launched a major offensive on June 18, 1098 against Kerboga's forces. At that moment, Dukak and other emirs, fearing Kerboga's potential rule if victorious, had already left Kerboga's army. The remaining army suffered a significant defeat. Kerboga barely escaped with his life and returned to Mosul without his army. Sems i Devla, besieged within the inner citadel, negotiated with the Crusaders after this victory and secured safe passage for himself and his soldiers. The inner citadel also fell into the hands of the Crusaders. 
This unexpected triumph turned into a Christian legend, claiming that Christian saints led the Crusader army, defeating Kerboga's forces. Following this unexpected victory, the Crusader army remained in Antioch for a while, facing the need to resolve a major dispute among its noble leaders. When the Crusader commanders had sworn allegiance to the Byzantine Emperor while in Constantinople, they had agreed to return former Byzantine territories they would conquer. Antioch, being an important ancient Byzantine city with a significant Greek-speaking Christian population, was subject to debate. Franks from northern France, southern French Crusaders, and southern Italian Normans clashed over the city's fate. Beaumundo, the Norman from southern Italy, claimed that their oath was void since the Byzantine emperor did not join them and argued for personal rule over Antioch and its surroundings due to his personal achievements in capturing the city. Toulouse Count Raymond de Saint Giles strongly opposed this claim. In the midst of these disagreements, a plague broke out between July and August, affecting both the Crusader army and the city's population. Many, including Archbishop Adamar, died on August 1, 1098. Due to horses being slaughtered for consumption during the siege, the Crusader knights found themselves without mounts. Constantly securing provisions for the Crusaders and the city's population became essential. Initially, local Muslims avoided supplying them. Resorting to force, the Crusaders launched raids on nearby villages, towns, and cities, forcefully collecting horses and supplies. One notable example is the assault on the castle of Ma'arat al Numan in December, where Crusaders reportedly resorted to cannibalism after capturing the city from the besieged Muslim population. Abd al-Allah was completely razed to the ground after the attack on January 13, 1099. Even the stones of its castle were dismantled, erasing the city entirely. Many Arab cities sent envoys and gifts, assuring the Crusaders that they would fulfill all their demands. However, particularly among the non-noble Crusaders, Concerns grew as they were increasingly anxious to fulfill their goal of reaching Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. Finally, in 1099, the Crusader army departed from Antioch to resume their march towards Jerusalem. Nevertheless, the city was not returned to the Byzantines, and the Principality of Antioch was established with Beaumondo as its ruler. Passage from Antioch to Jerusalem a chronological overview of the Crusader army's passage from Antioch to Jerusalem and the battles fought can be summarized as follows. January 13. The Crusader army, led by Raymond of Toulouse, begins its march southward from Antioch. January 16. The Crusader army passes by the city of Sekar without assaulting it. January 28. Raymond of Toulouse captures the fortress of Hisan el Akran. February 14 to May 13, Raymond of Toulouse unsuccessfully besieges the fortress of Akka. February 17, the Crusader army captures and plunders the city of Tartus. March 2, Godefroy de Bouillon's unsuccessful attack on the fortress of Jabala. May 16, the Crusader army bypasses the city of Tripoli without launching an assault. May 26-29, the Crusader army takes a three-day break and rests near Caesarea. June 1, the Crusader army captures the city of Arsif and turns eastward towards Ramallah and Jerusalem. June 1, the port city of Jaffa, serving as a gateway to Jerusalem, is destroyed and abandoned by Fatimid military forces. June 2, the Crusader army captures the city of Ramallah and reorganizes to proceed towards Jerusalem. June 6-7, a Crusader army, commanded by Tancred and Bedouin of Borg, captures the city of Bethlehem. July 7, the Crusader army reaches the outskirts of Jerusalem and begins the siege of Jerusalem. Fatimid Attitude The Fatimids, holding the seat of power in Cairo, 
led by Grand Vizier El Afdal Shahinsha, a Shiite and an Armenian convert, harbored a strong dislike for Sunnis and Seljuk Turks. They were displeased with the Seljuks gaining control of former Fatimid territories, including Syria, Palestine, and Jerusalem. Contemporary Arab historians, such as Ali ibn el Esser, attribute the success of the First Crusade and the eventual loss of the Eastern Mediterranean to the primary cause of division among Muslims. As early as April 1097, the Fatimid Grand Vizier El Afdal was informed by Byzantine envoys arriving in Cairo that heavily armored Christian armies were marching towards Constantinople, aiming to capture Jerusalem. Subsequent news about the progress of the Crusaders in Anatolia also reached Egypt through the Byzantines. During the Siege of Antioch, El Afdal sent a Fatimid envoy bearing substantial gifts to the Crusaders, expressing goodwill and offering a proposed division of Syria through the river known as Nair al kelp just north of Beirut as the new northern border of the Fatimid state. The Crusaders, preoccupied with the Siege of Antioch, did not respond positively to this proposal. However, El Afdal expected that this border would be accepted. In June 1098, Cairo received news of the fall of Antioch and, three weeks later, the defeat of Kerboga. El Afdal's reaction to these events is described as a surprise by the Arab historian El Khalasini. In July 1098, El Afdal led a large Fatimid army to Palestine. This army, starting from Egypt, arrived in Jerusalem and besieged the city with the aim of capturing it. The Seljuk rulers of Jerusalem, Sokman Bey of the Artukids and Ilghazi Bey, had gone to Antioch for assistance during the Antioch siege, participated in Kerboga's campaign, and returned to Jerusalem after the defeat. After a resistance lasting about 40 days, Jerusalem fell to the Fatimids. El Afdal treated the rulers of Artukids well, allowing them and their retinue to leave for northern Syria. Subsequently, the Fatimids assumed control over the cities and fortresses along the coastal areas of Palestine and Lebanon. The Byzantine Empire and European traders engaged in trade with Egypt closely monitored this new situation. The Fatimid Grand Vizier, aware of the Crusader armies, believed that, like the Byzantines with whom they had close relations, these new Christian armies would adhere to diplomatic and foreign policy norms. Due to this misjudgment, the Fatimid Grand Vizier left a relatively small army under the command of Iftikhar al dawla in Jerusalem and withdrew to Egypt. When El Afdal received news of the renewed southward march of the Crusader armies in January 1099, he realized that the Fatimids were in a precarious situation. He could not assemble a new army to counter the Crusaders. He sent a letter to the Byzantine Emperor, urging him to do his best to stop the Crusaders. However, the Crusader leaders disregarded the suggestion to delay their journey to Jerusalem while besieging the fortress of Arca. The Crusaders responded sharply to El Afdal's envoy, who requested that they stop north of the Dog River and refrain from entering the southern Fatimid territories. With the retort, our spears are sharp in the field of battle. We are all going to Jerusalem. On May 19, 1099, the Crusader armies crossed the Dog River and entered Fatimid territories. The commander of Jerusalem, Iftikhar al dawla was an experienced military leader. The damage to the fortress walls from El Afdal's siege was quickly repaired. Before falling into Fatimid hands, the Jerusalem fortress had been well stocked by Seljuk commanders, and provisions used during El Afdal's siege were replenished. The city's surroundings were poisoned, including water sources and wells. Following the experience of the Antioch siege, Iftikhar al dawla expelled Christians from the city and prepared the city for a prolonged siege. Siege of Jerusalem The Crusader army marching towards Jerusalem was led by Raymond de Saint Giles, Count of Toulouse. 
After a long and grueling journey and numerous raids and massacres against Muslims, they finally reached Jerusalem on July 7, 1099. The initial movements of the Christian Crusader armies reportedly surprised the Muslims in Jerusalem. It is recorded that the Crusader armies and their followers, openly praying with uncovered heads, circled the city, weeping and singing hymns led by priests, throwing themselves at the city walls in a religious fervor. However, the Crusader soldiers soon took control of the situation, and the siege began in earnest. During the Siege of Jerusalem, the Crusader armies launched several unsuccessful attacks on the city walls and were repelled. It became evident that constructing catapults and towers for the siege was not feasible. However, the Genoese, who had arrived in Palestine, dismantled their ships near Jaffa, brought the wood to Jerusalem, and built two large siege towers. These towers were brought to the walls of the city on the night of July 14. According to the primary source Gesta, on July 15, one of these towers, commanded by Godefroy, was positioned in front of the northeastern gate of the city. Two Flemish knights from his army successfully entered the city from the tower. Following this, Godefroy, his brother Eustace of Boulogne, Tancred, and their troops also entered the city. The second tower under Raymond's command could not progress due to a trench. However, upon learning that the Crusaders had entered the city, the defense commander of the gate, Iftikhar al-Dala, realized that he could not resist much longer. Raymond sent a messenger, offering that if Iftikhar al-Dala surrendered, he and his army would be allowed to leave Jerusalem unharmed. Iftikhar al-Dala, without much hesitation, accepted Raymond's offers, surrendered, and opened the city gates to the Crusaders. Raymond kept his word, and Iftikhar al-Dala and his army left Jerusalem in the evening, heading for the fortress of Escalon. Jerusalem fell into the hands of the Crusaders. Occupation of Jerusalem and Massacre of Muslims and Jews Main Article, Siege of Jerusalem on the afternoon of July 15, 1099, in the evening and the following morning, members of the Crusader army began a rare and brutal massacre of all Muslims and Jews in Jerusalem. Within two days, the Crusader army slaughtered more than 70,000 Muslims and Jews in the city. Many Muslims had sought refuge in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Noble Sanctuary, and the Temple Mount, while Jews had taken shelter in their synagogues near the Western Wall. All who sought refuge, both Muslims and Jews, were killed on the Temple Mount. This historical fact is documented by both Western European crusaders who wrote history and Arab sources of the time. An unnamed Latin historian of the time, in his work, Gesta Francorum, describes the situation as follows. Our men followed to Solomon's temple, until they were killed and the blood flowed like rivers. So many were killed that our men's feet were covered up to their ankles. Similarly, another primary source, Boucher de Chartres, in his chronicle, states, 10,000 were killed in this temple. Indeed, if you had been there, you would have seen our feet colored to our ankles with the blood of the slain. A crusader writer, Raymond Dagailers, in his work, Historia Francorum qui s'apparent i Jerusalem, recounts this brutality with pride. Marvelous scenes were witnessed. Some of our men cut off the heads of their enemies. Others shot them with arrows, so that they fell from the towers. Others tortured them longer by casting them into the flames. Piles of heads, hands, and feet were to be seen in the streets of the city. It was necessary to pick one's way over the bodies of men and horses. But these were small matters compared to what happened at the Temple of Solomon, a place where religious services were ordinarily chanted. What happened there? If I tell the truth, it will exceed your powers of belief. So let it suffice to say this much, at least, that in the Temple and Porch of Solomon, men rode in blood up to their knees in bridal reins. 
Ibn al kawanisi a Syrian historian, writes in his monumental work, al kamil fil Turi, the population of the sacred city was put to the sword, and the Franks perpetrated a great massacre of the Muslim and Jewish inhabitants in a week. Some writers attempt to downplay the significance of this massacre by claiming that some Muslims survived. For example, the crusader commander Tancred allegedly wanted to spare some of the Muslims who had taken refuge around the Temple Mount, but other crusaders did not listen to him and continued the slaughter. Similarly, an unnamed author of Gesta Francorum writes, When the city was taken from the unbelievers, our men took many of the captives, both men and women, and slaughtered them or burned them. This statement, highlighting the sparing of some lives, is used to suggest the relative mercy of the Crusaders. However, other Crusader writers reveal a different aspect, mentioning that after the city fell, all surviving Arabs' bodies were thrown out of the city gates, creating piles like high houses. The same author writes, Our leaders ordered that the city be cleared of the filth of the slain Arabs, and so the corpses were cast out of the city, and there was not one left to bury the dead. The magnitude of the slaughter of the infidels could not have been greater. No one ever saw or heard of such slaughter of God's foes, for they threw the dead bodies from the towers and the walls. In conclusion, despite attempts to present a neutral view and claim that some Muslims survived the Christian massacre, there is no possibility of concealing the fact that the result of the capture of Jerusalem by the Crusaders during the First Crusade was the widespread and brutal killing of the Muslim and Jewish population of the city. While there is a lack of exhaustive documentary primary sources regarding how many were killed and to simplify estimating how many were killed, it is true that there are no entirely credible documentary primary sources for any event of the 11th century. Crusader States After the capture of Jerusalem by the Crusaders, the noble commanders of the Crusader army held a meeting at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on July 22 to discuss the governance of the holy city they had just conquered. They decided to establish a new kingdom of Jerusalem, which would be authorized to deal with non-religious state affairs in the sacred lands considered holy by Christians, including Jerusalem itself, the southern part of Syria, and Palestine. It was expected that Raymond, Count of Toulouse, would be placed at the head of this state by the majority of those attending the meeting. Raymond, either to portray himself as a humble religious figure or because he expected the nobles present to choose him anyway, initially hesitated to accept this kingship. On the other hand, Godefroy de Bouillon, his rival, did not show such hesitation. Utilizing the popularity he gained among the Crusader nobles for his contribution to the siege and conquest of Antioch, Godefroy successfully secured his election as the Holy King of Jerusalem. Raymond did not take this development lightly and, in fact, reacted strongly by withdrawing with his forces from Jerusalem to establish a rural camp. Godefroy de Bouillon, chosen as the King of Jerusalem, reportedly refused to take the title of King of Jerusalem, either to demonstrate modesty or accepted the title of Advocatus Sancti Sepulchre, instead. It is unclear whether this title was actually used and what it meant, leading to different interpretations. After this election, it is known that Godefroy personally did not use this title and only used the title of Princeps, or, more simply, his previous title as the Duke of Lower Lorraine. William of Tyre, an authoritative crusader historian from the 12th century, wrote that Godefroy insisted on not wearing the golden crown of the Kingdom of Jerusalem because it was made from thorns, symbolizing the crown of thorns of Jesus. Although papal representative Dimebert of Pisa, who participated in the First Crusade, wanted the kingdom to be a theocratic state under the administration of the Pope, this thesis was not accepted. Instead, the new kingdom was established and developed in a manner suitable for the governance and customs of Western European Franks. However, 
Some administrative organs and styles were developed uniquely for this kingdom. In addition to the Kingdom of Jerusalem, independent states were established before the conquest of Jerusalem, including the County of Edessa and the Principality of Antioch. After the occupation of Jerusalem, the County of Tripoli was established as an independent state with special status, following the Crusaders' occupation of Tripoli in 1109. Battle of Ascalon against the Fatimids After the surrender of Jerusalem to the Crusaders, the Fatimid governor of Jerusalem, Iftikhar al dala had withdrawn to Ascalon. In this coastal city in the southeast of Palestine, the Fatimid ruler, Vizier Afdal Shahensha, began to gather an army. Although the Fatimids had agreed to cede Syria to the Crusaders in a deal, they were determined not to surrender Palestine and Jerusalem. The Fatimid army assembled in Ascalon was not composed solely of soldiers from the Fatimid-ruled Egypt. It also included troops from various Muslim countries. The total strength of this army is reported to be likely around 20,000, but some sources claim it was as high as 50,000. On August 5th, an envoy sent by the Fatimid vizier arrived in Jerusalem, requesting the Crusaders to leave the city and Palestine. However, the Crusaders did not record this request. The newly elected king of Jerusalem, Godefroy de Bouillon, decided to march against the Fatimid army in Ascalon, located a day's journey from Jerusalem. Toulouse Count Raymond de St. Giles and Robert Curtoz did not join this expedition. However, Arnouf, who was elected as the new Catholic Cardinal of Jerusalem and tasked with bringing the True Cross to the battle, along with Raymond of Aguilers and Pierre Lermite, religious leaders of the Catholic Church who re-emerged in Jerusalem after the failure of the People's Crusade, participated. After religious rites and ceremonies on August 10, this crusader army, according to a document left by Raymond of Aguilers, consisted of 9,000 infantry and 1,050 heavy cavalry. Both Arab and crusader sources state that the Fatimid vizier did not expect the crusaders to attack with such an army immediately. The Fatimid army and the vizier were unprepared for battle. On August 11, the Crusader army, arriving in front of Ascalon, immediately attacked the unprepared Fatimid army in the Makdal Valley in front of the city walls. Due to their lack of preparedness, the Fatimid army could not offer much resistance. Although the Fatimid army was numerous, some units could not participate in the battle. Especially the Fatimid heavy cavalry did not join the battle while the Crusader knights made devastating attacks against the Fatimid infantry. After a relatively short clash, the Fatimid vizier lost morale and withdrew his army into the well-protected Ascalon castle. The Crusader army seized the Fatimid treasury and looted their wealth. Crusader sources report losses of 10,000 to 12,000 from the Fatimid army, but there is no documented information about Crusader losses. The next day, it was revealed that part of the Fatimid army, along with the Mamluks of the vizier, had returned to Egypt by sea. Thus, the Fatimids surrendered Jerusalem and Palestine to the new Kingdom of Jerusalem. However, Ascalon Castle remained in Fatimid hands until 1153. 1101 Crusades In the third phase of the First Crusade, additional Crusades were launched from Europe in 1101 to support the Frankish Crusaders settled in Palestine. These expeditions took the form of three different armies marching in succession from Constantinople. Sultan Kilij Arslan I, who had previously employed a relatively distant tracking strategy in the Crusades, changed his tactics for these expeditions. He ordered the destruction of all settlements, cultivated crops, and food supplies along the path of the Crusader army, attempting to prevent the supply of provisions and animal feed to the Crusaders. He decided to disable or poison important water wells and sources, causing the Crusaders to weaken due to dehydration. 
This new strategy yielded more successful results, leading to the destruction of all three Crusader armies participating in the 1101 Crusades within Anatolia, in Mirzafan and Aragli. In May 1101, an unexpected turn occurred when a Crusader army of 20,000, led by the experienced Raymond and originally under the command of Anselm, the Bishop of Milan, arrived in Istanbul from Italy. The army, which had returned from Jerusalem to Istanbul, headed towards Ankara, seized the city, and moved towards Nixer. In August, a battle took place in Mirzafan with the army of Anatolian Seljuk Sultan Kilij Arslan I and the Danishman Ghazi, resulting in the destruction of four-fifths of this crusader army. Women and children fell into the hands of the Turks as captives. By the end of June, a French crusader army under the command of Count William of Nevers advanced from Ankara to Aragli via Ankara and Konya. Soon, this crusader army realized that following this path was a mistake because the previous crusader expedition led by the barons had devastated the surrounding area. The army became exhausted due to the inability to find provisions and animal feed. In late August, the armies of Anatolian Seljuk Sultan Kilij Arslan I and Danishman Ghazi arrived in Aragli and immediately launched an attack, annihilating this army. The commander of this army, William of Nevers, managed to reach Antioch with the help of a Turkish-origin Byzantine soldier, Turkopol. A week's delay followed, with a third crusader army consisting of French led by William of Aquitaine and Germans led by Duke Wolf of Bavaria. This crusader army, both soldiers and non-combatant camp followers, reached Aragli again in a state of complete ruin, suffering from hunger and especially thirst. Upon reaching a stream they found, they threw themselves into it to quench their thirst. Unfortunately, this water had been poisoned by the Seljuks, and Sultan Kilij Arslan awaited in ambush with his army. Thus, this third crusader army, with most soldiers dead and survivors taken captive, was eliminated. The commanders of this army, William of Aquitaine and Duke Wolf, personally managed to escape to Antioch. This 1101 additional crusade turned out to be such a dreadful and colossal failure that it led to the complete and almost immediate oblivion of this campaign by the European world.